Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to Building My Legacy podcast today. I have with me today um, Rich Kasparian. He has a company in Garden City, New York, helping its financial planning, helping people look at the next chapter of their life. What do they do with their investments? What have they planned with their insurance? If they are going to retire, what does that mean? What does it mean with succession planning? So all the things that we need to look at in terms of um, growing a business for our future and then being able to walk, sell, whatever we want to do with that. So on that note, Rich, I'm going to turn this over to you. You can share a little bit about your background, what brought you to doing this, and then we'll talk about what the things are that people should be thinking about and planning for. Thank you, Lois, and uh, it's great to be on your podcast. I appreciate it. Um, Again, my name is Rich Kasparian. My company is Garden City Financial Group. Uh, We're based out of Garden City, Long Island in New York. Um, Our customer base is throughout the country, so it's not really just limited to one region. Um, Years ago, I I was a, um, back in the old days, I, I worked on Wall Street for many years. Then I transitioned to Smith Barney which now is, uh, was taken over years ago by um, Morgan Stanley. I was there for many years in uh, City Smith Barney. I then transitioned about 11 years ago into my own practice, Garden City Financial Group. Um, and our, you know, our basic goal is to help business owners, small business owners and individuals plan for their future. But more importantly, you know, look at the market as a whole. And it's not just always about hoping things go higher. Uh, But one of the the, uh, goals that I built my whole career on is trying to find ways to protect customers' downsides uh, if things should ever turn ugly, which they do. Um, And also we look at insurance planning, business succession planning, uh, long-term care, uh, retirement, and, you know, many other aspects of uh, planning. So, Rich, those are huge areas. People spend a life growing and building a business and hoping that they have something to uh, fall back on or for their retirement. What are the top three things that you think people should be thinking about as they prepare for retirement? Um, I, I think there, there are a couple of aspects as a whole in planning and, and, and um, for the future and even investing as a whole. Um, many, many advisors out there, you know, they sort of had this theory or this concept of a customer has or a client has X amount of dollars they want to put away for the future. And they'll basically give them a plan for every dollar of that, of that amount of money. I pride myself in being somewhat of a contrarian. I work backwards. So the first thing I'll always say to a customer is, how much money do you need to leave in the bank for safekeeping, for the rainy day, for those extra things that pop up? Because the goal really is, if you're going to invest money, especially for retirement, you want to be able to leave it there and grow. So that's the first thing that I always, you know, impress upon customers. Now, for everyone, that dollar amount is different. Some people, it's $5,000. Some people, it's $100,000. Some people, it could be $10 million. It's all predicated on what what people are looking for. So once we sort of have that, uh, then I break things up into two remaining piles. The second pile is the the middle-term goals. Let's say a three- to six-year goal. Uh, for investing. And then th- the final part of it is the long-term or the retirement part of ve- investing, which is the long-term retirement. This is the money I don't want to touch until I retire. 
So those are sort of three avenues um, that I that I start with as a basis. Uh, and in terms of of what a customer or, or a client would be looking for, um, do they plan to remain, you know, living in the state that they're in? That's number one. Uh, number two, when do they actually see themselves retiring? At what age? You know, years ago, we, you know, people were retiring at 55. I mean, those days are long over. People are working much longer now. Um, and then the third thing is, you know, what is sort of their stomach for risk tolerance or the stomach for the ups and downs of the market? So I think once we tackle all of that, then we, you know, we can build a plan going forward. So, Rich, as you work with people, what are some of the biggest mistakes people make? Um, One mistake is this concept that we hear all the time, especially on TV, the talking heads of diversification. I want diversification. Um, In concept, it's it's a good theory, but in practice, it rarely happens. So I'll give you an example. Someone might have a retirement plan and they get this little booklet, maybe at work, or they look it up on the internet or an advisor says to them, we're going to diversify your portfolio. So they pretty much like a dartboard, they say, okay, I'm going to take this growth fund and I'm going to utilize this value fund and this bond fund um, and this mid cap fund. And they build this sort of little portfolio, let's say, amongst their retirement and assets. But when we really drill down, and this is where when I, one of the things I do when a client, you know, summons me on the website or they need help, one of the things we do is we evaluate their portfolios to see what, how they're invested and what they have already. Um, On our website, by the way, is uh, www.gardencityfinancialgroup.com. But when you drill down on these funds, in many cases, it's very ironic, they all own the same companies. So I, I've, I've had customers at times or clients at times send me statements from different accounts that they have. And they say, I'm well diversified. And when we drill down and we look, they might own five or six funds. They all own Apple. They all own Microsoft. They all own Google. You know, so at the at the end of the day, the, a fund might have a different title, or may even be a different company, like Fidelity versus Nuveen, but yet yet they will all own the same fund. So one of the things I I look at is, in, especially in a review, is we want to make sure are you really truly diversified, um, and that that's that's a sort of a key challenge, and and sort of a uh, a thing that. People don't look at you know deeply when they're when they're trying to figure out you know how how do I go forward and how do I invest. So diversification gets to be a problem because companies are merging all the time; they're being um, acquired, and those changes have a profound impact on your portfolio, and you may not realize it, right? So it's almost as though you need to do a review of your diversification within your portfolio periodically to stay on top of that. that That's correct. correct. Yes. Yes, that's absolutely correct. I mean, generally speaking, you know, um, we try to do reviews with customers. It it all depends. You know, I I have some customers who only want to do a yearly review. Um, Some customers we look at every six months and some customers we might look at quarterly. Um, quarterly reviews. Um, it you know it depends on you know a person's schedule and if they're busy and 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 what the situation is. But yeah, you you, you definitely want to do a review. The, one of the most important things and and how we pride our business, you know, at Garden City Financial Group, is is we really heavily focus on investments, products, or programs that protect customers' downsides. So uh, we know that you can be well diversified, but if the S&P 500 is down 30%, you'll be down 30% or more if you're even more aggressive than that. 
Um, but there are many programs out there now that I've been utilizing for years, and actually they've improved little by little over the years, where you, you, you can be invested and you'll have protection of a, of a certain percentage on the downside of the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000 or the Dow Jones. Um, so, and, and there are also other programs out there that pres- provide protection along with um, guaranteed income for retirement in the future. Um, so, so yes, diversification is important. Reviews are important. But one of the really key factors nowadays is utilizing programs that can really help the, you know, the downside. So for example, you know, if you have a program that's protecting your downside, everyone else you know is down. You might be down, but you might not be down as much during those, those trying periods. So, Rich, why would somebody not have downside protection? Um, in many cases, uh, because people, you know, will typically invest in sort of the old fashioned or the normal way. They'll buy stocks. They'll they'll buy mutual funds. Uh, we hear a lot about obviously ETFs, which stands for exchange traded funds. Um, and generally speaking, if you're buying those assets individually, they don't come with any kind of downside protection. The same as a typical 401k at work. Um, they typically don't come with downside protection, which is a big part of our business because many times when people do retire, they then want to roll it over into something that provides that sort of downside protection. And, and to answer your question, also, um, some, of the, some of the programs that are out there are more complex um, that, that maybe advisors aren't presenting or people aren't sort of finding them on their own. But they've been out there and they've been out there for years. Um, some are available through investment companies. Some are available through insurance companies. Got it. So as people are planning for retirement and they're looking for a financial advisor, what are the questions they should be asking of that financial advisor um, when they're seeking them out? How do you discern whether or not you've got the right one for you? It's a great, that's a really great question. Um, Because we often kid sometimes when, when I speak to clients, you know, if you talk to 10 financial advisors, you might get 10 different opinions. Um, um, I think, I think the first opinion or the first thing you want to find out is what is the philosophy? Um, what is their overall philosophy on the market? Um, if their philosophy is we buy this to hope that the market goes higher, well, that's not really a philosophy. Uh, what, what is the concept on the market? So I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's take, let, you know, because this is on for, uh, foremost on people's minds. Like, let's see what just happened with GameStop a couple of weeks back. So the big boys, the hedge funds, uh, the word was, was they were going to short GameStop and some other stocks like it to zero or basically put them out of business or close to it. Now, for those of you who don't know what shorting a stock is, it basically is a bet against the market, a bet against the company that it will go down. So um, that's and it's it's totally legitimate. What you're actually doing, you know, not not to get so technical, you're borrowing the stock from the house and selling it first at a high price. When it drops, you will then you buy it back at a lower price. The difference in the middle is profit. So it's obviously the opposite of when people buy a stock and want to go high. So, but coming back to it, so the big boys were going to bring the stock down. And then a bunch of gamers, let's call them on Reddit, said, no, you're not. You're not going to bring this stock down. We're going to keep, we're going to, all the little guys are going to buy it. So the little guys bought it and it created what we call a short squeeze. What a short squeeze is, is when the guys own it high and want it to go low, but the stock now keeps going up. The more it goes up, the more money they lose. So they have to bail at some point. Well, lo and behold, those hedge funds lost billions that day. But 
The hedge funds then came back, started crying on politicians' laps. All of a sudden, politicians who are supposed to protect the little guy are protecting now the big guy. And the big guys then started to punish the little investors over those next few days. So my point is in all of this, philosophy on the market is I tell customers straight up, the market can go up, but it can also go down. There are things in the market that make absolutely no sense. Sometimes you'll look at the news, the stock should go up, it goes down. Sometimes you'll look at the news, it goes up when it should go up. We, we, we just never really know. Um, so you have to prepare. So philosophy is king. I, I, I say that all the time. Customers have to know that the market is some, sometimes somewhat of a, a game that nobody really knows behind the scenes what totally is going on, especially when the big boys are pulling the strings. So philosophy is, is, is number one with an advisor. Um, what's their perception? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I'm sorry. There for a moment. So philosophy is important. I, I think most people understand the market's going up and down, but then you have to have a philosophy around that. Is the philosophy about how you manage risk? Is the philosophy about how you, um, when when you decide that it is no longer worth holding, how do you create a philosophy out of that? It, it's really, I believe, it's 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 the managing risk. So, um, so one of the things, you, you know, when, when I'm, um, when I, we finally come up with a plan for a customer and, and we're going to, you know, present it and, and move forward with a plan, I'll generally talk in many cases about the downside first. So normally, you know, what, what most investors are used to hearing is what's my profit? What am I going to make? How well am I going to do on it? In many cases with the programs that we utilize, like I've said before, downside protection, income for life, I'll talk about worst case scenarios. So customers could see, well, if I own this program, what is my worst case scenario first? Then we'll talk about the growth position. So I, I, I think that that's sort of where it is. It, it is mount, it's, it's the philosophy on downside risk. Um, and also sometimes when things are, 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 are dropping, you know, do I pull the plug? Don't I pull the plug? I mean, there, there are scenarios like that, but if you can, if you have your portfolio as, as we do at Garden City Financial Group for most of our customers, unless the ones who just want complete risk, um, you feel good. You, you know, you, you, you could put your head on the pillow at night knowing that when you, when you have assets that have downside protection, some sort of downside protection, you, you generally will sleep better. Got it. Okay. So the one thing you look at is philosophy. What else do you look at when choosing an advisor? Uh, you know, what is, their, what is their array of programs or, or products that they're discussing? Um, you know, Wall Street over the years has, has become some what compressed and you know, what, what we've constantly hear now on wall street is I'm in a managed account. I'm in a managed account. I'm in a managed account. Um, a lot of these managed accounts are really not that managed. Um, a lot of them are rely on computer models that, you know, kick things in and out of the account. Um, so they're really not managed. You know, I use I always use the a- analogy on on this managed account concept. It's um, you know like you you were sold the private country club and you end up at the public golf course. Um, so I, I think an open architecture uh, as as your financial advisor is 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 the key. If someone is doing a lot of transactions, a managed account is perfect because. The, the fees are set at sort of one fee. If someone is, is not doing a lot of transactions, that might not make sense because they're not doing a lot of, you know, back and forth transactions that, that could add up, you know, in fees. So, um, so th- that's, that's sort of another issue that I think is important. Okay. What else? Um, 
the the third the third thing I, I think of is is does the advisor talk about, about anything other than investments? Are they talking about insurance? Are they talking about do you have an updated will? Are they talking about long term care? Are they talking about business succession planning? Um, are they talking about um, beneficiaries and beneficiary updates on accounts. You know, families have a lot of times changing dynamics. They do a will and five years later, something changes or someone gets married or someone gets divorced as a beneficiary. So I think those are important keys too, where where the advisor should be involved in many aspects of, uh, you know, I've sometimes often said to, to people privately um, customers or clients tell me things that they don't tell anybody else because, uh, you know, they need it in confidence, especially in many cases when it comes to who's going to be my beneficiary, what percentage should I put down or who, you know, who's going to be in the will. And one of the things we do here is we will coordinate with your accountant. We will coordinate with your attorney or lawyer while you're, you're trying to do some of these things. You know, I, on many cases, I have clients' attorneys call me and ask questions, and in many cases, I deal with their accountants, especially during tax season. So what you're really saying is if you want a good plan for the end of your life for retirement, you've got to have somebody who has a comprehensive look. So um, it would be like having a internist who would take care of all the problems, medical problems that you have as as an example, right? Who can oversee and make sure that there aren't pieces that are being left out or forgotten. Am I correct there? Yes. Yeah. It's sort of the, you know, we'll use the, the, the um, sports analogy, the quarterback, so to speak. Okay. Um, you know, you, you really kind of want to want the per- person to be a, a quarterback. And also, you know, legacy becomes p- part of it. Um, knowing also that family members d- down the line um, will have access to the advisor as well. Um, you know, in terms of if they have questions on, on their own things or, you know, God forbid their, you know, their parents should pass away, you know, what's going to happen? They, you know, they need to be in the loop. So, yeah, I I think all of that coordination is the most important thing. So when you sit down with people, one of the questions I'm sure people ask of you is, what do they really need in order to have thoughtfully prepared for retirement? And obviously, that's going to depend upon a person's income and what they have in terms of assets. And um, but are there formulas that you follow in terms of how people should plan, how they should think, um, and when they're ready? Yeah, I mean, there like, like um, there are formulas. I would say for investing, there are also formulas for how much uh, insurance people need. Um, it. it the formulas on, on investing or retirement do become a little difficult because most people that you, you talk to, many do not have real – that we do come across a lot. So, so again, working backwards, what's your Social Security payment going to be You know, at age 62 or 66? Does it make sense? to take it at 62? Does it make sense to take it at 66? You know, so you have, so, so that's one thing. Do you have a pension? Do you have a 401k left over from an, from an old company? Um, Do you currently have a retirement and how much are you putting into it? Do you have any additional IRA or retirement accounts out there? Um, What's your current income now? Do you plan to live here or do you plan to move somewhere less expensive? So once we kind of determine all of that, then we have to put a plan in place with what they have in front of us to determine from this point on, this is how we can grow and protect what you have currently. 
But from this point on, this is what we think you need to put away to, to enjoy sort of a comfortable lifestyle. Now, on the insurance plateau, that's a little bit different. For life insurance, most people are, are very underinsured. So, for example, if, a, if someone is 40 years old and has three, three young children, for them to have a million dollars in life insurance is not unusual and not really too much. I come across a lot of people who, you know, they have 100000 or 200000 They have a family of five. They have a, a mortgage with three or four or 500000 on it. And the idea is on the insurance, there is a, a pretty specific formula. Do you want the insurance to pay off the house? Do you want do you you want the insurance to be have income replacement that's lost for a couple of years? And do you want insurance to take care of education planning? If someone should, you know, lose their life in a at an early age. As people grow older, kids are out of the house. Um, maybe they don't need much insurance. Then you could sometimes look at reducing some of what they have. Um, but that's a, but that's a, and, and, and insurance then starts with a will. Do you have a will? If something were to happen, nobody wants to talk. And, we, and I have sort of an old joke that I've, that I've said to customers, just because you do a will and life insurance, it does not mean you're going to die. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but there's this, that sort of looming superstition about it. Um, but those are the two aspects of investing and, and insurance. So Rich, we have, we've covered a lot things we've left out that you think are important for people to think about that we've missed or that's been incomplete. No, I, I think you've you've been, you've been great. By the way, thank you. I appreciate really Lois being on your podcast. Uh, it's been terrific and informative. Um, our website is GardenCityFinancialGroup.com. So if people liked what they heard or sort of my philosophy on investing or retirement, you can you know can catch us there. Also have a YouTube channel, Garden City Financial Group on YouTube. Um, if you have an interest or you would like us to review your portfolio or have questions, you, you go to www.gardencityfinancialgroup.com. You hit the contact us tab and you can type in your information and someone would get back to you, you know, soon. Um, and again, you know, what we could do is we, we could help people review their portfolios, kind of see what their goals are and then take it from there. Okay, super. Um, Rich, so we will put that information in the show notes of the podcast so people can look you up or it'll be right there for them, the information that that they need. So um, we encourage people to do that. And um, also we'll link to your YouTube so that people can go there directly as well. So thank you so much thank for you. being with us today, Rich. And for those of you who are listening to Building My Legacy podcast, this is another step in that whole legacy building. What are you doing with your money? <laughs> how are you planning for it? And how is it being organized? So please remember to also visit our website at buildtomorrow.com. Thanks, everybody, for listening. You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sanstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sanstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.